Um, let you have the wheel, take the wheel here. And I'm going to try and make you the spotlight video. There you are. Howdy, friends. How's it going? <laughs> Welcome to Small House Farm. This is it right here. So I've got a bit of a hybrid presentation put together for you. We're going to do a little bit of slides at the beginning here, um, kind of set the stage for what we're going to be learning about together. Um, tell you a little bit about myself very briefly. Um, and get right into the herbs and such. And then we're going to come back to, to join each other again at this table where I have got a number of goodies together and we are going to craft some herbal products um, right here at my kitchen table. And that should be fun. And um, then we'll do some q and I'll try to remember to pause as we go along the way to, to cover any questions. Uh, so Pam, if any questions come up that are like really on topic that we should cover right away, let me know. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, but uh, then we'll we'll save some time for a big Q&A at the end, if need be. Um, I cut out about. my video, I figured. Um, I don't know who that is. Oh, hi. Um, do you look like a jerk? Mm -hmm. Is everyone muted? Laura, Ms. Burns. No, do a quick check. Okay. I'm going to mute. Okay. That should solve the problem. Maybe. All right, cool. So let's go ahead. We'll hop into this little slideshow thing and get that out of the way as fast as we can um, so we can get to making some goodies together. So let's see. We're going to go with this one right there. All right. So we're going to talk about living an herbal life. And, you know, for me at Small House, herbs are like a part of my life. But, you know, I can't separate those two things. Just like I can't separate the seeds that I grow and the food that I eat, um, the herbs that are food and medicine here at Small House, are part of who we are. Muted and me. I want to try to get that across to you guys the best that I can, um, that a natural, simple, slow way of living is paramount to a successful, happy life, right? Especially in these turbulent, wacky times that we live in right now. Uh, whew, slowing down and looking to mother nature as an example is just, uh, I think it's the, the secret to our success here. So let's click out here, Ben. There we go. Oh, there's the small house. Um, I just show a quick, quick picture of that, you know. We branded our, our homestead business, Small House Farm. And um, I have so many people that ask me if I live in a tiny house, like you see, you know, on a little trailer or something that they pull around. And uh, that would be fun, I suppose. But that's not the case. It's a regular size home, but regular size house didn't sound like it's cool of a business. So we went with small house. It's 1,100 square foot. So it's like plenty of space, you know, for everybody. But... I do have two boys, and uh, my oldest is going to be 12 soon, and he just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and the house is the same size, and um, I guess we'll have to rethink that later. But for now, small house farm, that's it. And then when you can see me, I mean, what, this room that we're in, this is pretty much half, half of the living space. So we're all being nice and cozy together today. This is uh, some of the small house products that we make. Um, like Pam mentioned, we, we offer a full line of herbal wellness products. Um, made from herbs that I grow myself or that I gather from the wild. We're blessed to be across the street from 1,100 acres of forest. Um, so we're able to do a lot of foraging for our food and medicine. And uh, we cold press a number of oils from seeds and nuts. And then we take these as ingredients and craft, like I said, a very full line of products, salves, and lotions, and balms, and tinctures, um, all sorts of stuff. That's kind of my nine to five gig, really. Um, so, you know, I spend half my work day out in the woods picking plants. So it's not, not a bad gig, I suppose, but enough about that. Let's talk about the herbs for you guys in your life, what you're going to do with herbs in your life. You know, um, the easiest way to incorporate herbs into a healthy lifestyle is in the kitchen, right? Um, and by herbs, I, these are the parts of the plant that we're going to talk about. Leaves, flowers, seeds bark and roots. Now technically some of these things would fall into the category of spice. Um, seeds, barks, that thing from a culinary standpoint are actually defined as spice, but we're calling it all herbs for the sake of our conversation tonight because I want to include as many plants as I can and I don't want to be limited by definition. Um, so we're talking about all these different parts of the plants. 
Um, some plants that we're going to work with, we can utilize all of these parts, the aerial as well as the below ground portions of the plants. Some we're going to focus specifically on the leaves or the flowers or whatever it may be. But all these different parts of the plants are useful. And sometimes even within one plant, the different parts are useful for different things. Nature's amazing like that. So like I said, the number one place to incorporate herbs in your life is in the kitchen. And that's where we're at right now here. This is kind of in my kitchen. Um, so I thought that'd be a good place to start the conversation. You know, to become more herbal in your life, is, it's so simple to, to just incorporate these herbs into your kitchen routines, to, to start to discover these plants through your food, all right? Um, now, so many of us, we have a spice rack, a little spice cupboard, uh, fill little jars of things. And, and sometimes, sometimes they'll sit on those shelves and not really be utilized the way that they should. But if we were to stop after this presentation and go to your kitchens and go and look through your spice racks and stuff, you'll discover a plethora of, of wonderful herbs. So many things uh, that you already have access to. So we don't even need to worry about growing herbs or foraging for herbs or purchasing herbs. So many of these plants we already have in our homes. We just need to go to our kitchens and look for them and then try to incorporate it into our meals. You know, this gives us an excellent opportunity to, to learn the profiles of these plants through the smell and the touch and the taste and to develop these relationships with the plants that we already have in our homes. These plants that we're looking to for a more herbal lifestyle, right? Sometimes I'll even bring plants in from the yard, weeds, I guess some people would call them, and I'll harvest them and cut them and I'll bring them right into the kitchen and I'll put them in a vase of water just so they're there, so that they're kind of top of mind. So I remember, oh, when I'm preparing my food, I got these plants and I want to try to work these plants into my lifestyle. These are like little baby steps. And as we work these baby steps into our life, it really, every small step forward has a, a large result, right? And this is where we got to start with herbs. We can also about think of herbs as direct application, right? Using them directly on the skin. Now, a lot of the times when we talk about salves and tinctures and all these things, it can seem, elaborate it can seem difficult challenging to craft these products so if we just think about herbs directly applied um that's quite simple and that's an easy way to use herbs in our life now the picture of this lady here she's totally chilling um with these cucumbers on her eyes and botanically cucumbers are fruit so i guess this isn't the most accurate picture but i thought it was a cool picture and it highlights the simplicity of using plants in our lives right so many times we can use these plants directly onto our skin, be it cucumbers on our eyes, which is certainly beneficial, or in the form of a compress or a poultice, right? Where we process these herbs, barely process them, macerate them with some water or something, use them topically on our skin. Uh, mustard seeds on our back to bust up a bad chest cold. Uh, comfrey on a broken bone to help heal a bone. Yarrow chewed up as a styptic on a wound to stop bleeding, right? I mean, there's very little process in these plants at all. Identifying the plants, harvesting the plants, putting them on our skin. It can be just that simple to include herbalism in our life. We can talk about water infusions. Now, water infusions is probably the most popular. When people think about herbs, we think about herbal tea, right? Uh, brewing tea. Now, we're going to brew some tea here in a little bit, as a matter of fact. I'm kind of jonesing for a cup, so we're going to do that as soon as the slideshow is over, actually. Uh, we're going to start making some water infusions. But what's happening here in a water infusion is that we're using hot water as an extraction, as the menstruum, right? This is extracting the chemical components from the plant material. Um, and you'll notice that when you make your tea, you'll see that the water changes color, that the aroma of the herbs is released and you can smell it, right? These are all signals to us that the extraction process is happening, that these chemical constituents are being removed from the plant material into our water for us to ingest. Now, water infusion isn't always necessarily tea either. Uh, my wife makes a, uh, a hair rinse that she'll use. She'll wash her hair with it. Um, I've got a, a topical water infusion here. When we get off the slides, I'll show this to you. Um, just because we think of tea, and I have a picture of a teapot, doesn't necessarily always mean that a water infusion is meant to be ingested. Sometimes they're topical as well. But we'll get into that in more depth here in a second. Tincture. This will be uh, maybe the second most common extraction, right? Now, a tincture is an alcohol extraction. This is using alcohol as our menstruum to extract the chemical components from our plant material, right? Now, some things are water-soluble. Not all chemicals are water-soluble, but almost everything within our plants is alcohol-soluble. So these tinctures are very potent herbal medicines, 
Whereas with our tea, we may drink uh, six to eight ounces at a time, multiple cups throughout the day, whatever it may be. With our tinctures, we measure these doses by the drops, quarter teaspoons, small, small amounts, right? These are very, very potent herbal medicines, these tinctures. We're gonna make a few in a little bit. I got some examples, we're gonna walk through them. Infused oils, right? Now this is what we do a lot of here at Small House. This is kind of like the bread and butter in the business, right? Just because I cold press these oils, um, I, I have access to, to a, a variety of oil that we then use in our products. Um, and we can use this now, this is fat, is our menstruum that we're extracting the chemical components with this. The fat that pulls the chemicals um, out of the plant material. And we can use these oils directly onto our skin, right? We can then craft them into a salve, a lotion, or a balm. I have examples of all those things, and we're gonna break that down. The greatest difference in these products really being the ratio of oil to beeswax. And I got the ratios here, we're gonna get into that in a little bit, um, and we're gonna make some of those products as well. Uh, but these are essentially taking these herb-infused oils and making them portable with the use of wax. Now let's talk about a few local herbs. I'm a big fan of local herbs. Um, we don't have time for it necessarily this evening for me to uh, stand on my soapbox and go on about why local is the key to success. Um, but we'll touch on it briefly, maybe. Yeah, I think we should. First off, when we use local herbs, it gives us this opportunity to develop these relationships with the plants that grow in our own bioregion, with these herbs that grow in our own yards, in our own fields, in our local parks and in our forests, right? These are the plants that are part of our, our local area. These are plants that are a part of our neighborhood. They're like our neighbors, right? This also gives us excellent, excellent, excellent educational opportunities. Here's an example. Um, we make at Small House a pain relief and rub, you know, like a sore muscle salve, right? And I'll sell it at markets and things, and people at markets will always be like, oh yeah, you know, I read about Arnica on the internet. Do you use Arnica in your product? I don't. Uh, there's nothing wrong with Arnica by any means, but I mean, it's a potent herb. Here in Michigan, there's only one species of Arnica that grows wild. Um, it grows in the UP. It doesn't grow where I'm at. It grows in the UP and it's endangered. I'm not allowed to harvest it. So for me, as a wild crafted herb, Arnica is off the table. So to create a sore muscle salve, instead of just pur purchasing some Arnica that I had no relationship with, I had to take the time to explore my local bioregion and learn about the plants around me. And through some exploration, I came across wintergreen. Um, wintergreen is a wonderful medicinal herb for topical pain relief. Um, it has a compound in it called methyl salicylate, which is similar to what they use to make aspirin. We make a very potent herbal rub with wintergreen as opposed to arnica. Um, so not only is it a successful product that, that my customers and, and clients enjoy, but I had that opportunity to learn about the plants that are literally underneath my feet when I go outside of my house, right? Mother Nature provides for everything that we need and it's right underneath our feet everywhere that we go. And if I would have just simply bought some Arnica online, I wouldn't have learned that important lesson. When we focus on local herbs that grow in our parks and our fields and our forests, the impact on the environment is so much less than that of commercially purchased herbs, right? And we won't get into all the specifics, but just imagine the carbon footprint of herbs that are grown in the next country over, the other side of the planet, and everything that it takes to get those harvested, wrapped in plastic, shipped across the country, stocked on the shelf at your co-op, for you to drive your car to the co-op and then purchase these things, when these same plants are growing right here in our yards. That's enough of that soapbox. I think hopefully I've made my point. I'm gonna come back to that, I'm sure later. Let's talk about some of these plants that we have. This is an herb that we cultivate in our garden. Here's thyme, uh, thymus vulgaris, right? Um, delicious herb, these little tiny leaves. It's a fun, beautiful little plant. Um, great with the pollinators. I enjoy growing them in my garden. Um, it's got a nice savory flavor indeed, but it's a wonderful medicinal herb. Um, it's got a compound in it called thymol, right? That's the, the main essential oil in thyme, which is a very potent antiseptic. If you were to buy a non-alcohol mouthwash at the grocery store, thyme is the main ingredient, right? Potent stuff. In addition to that, it's a powerful expectorant, right? You can make a tea, a simple water infusion with thyme to knock out a cough in no time. When infused in oil and used as a topical rub on your chest, 
like I said, it's a potent expector. And it's really going to bust up a chest cold and get it on the move, right? Time. It's in our gardens. Rosemary. Rosemarinus. Or they've reclassified rosemary. I suppose it's a salvia now. It's a sage, they consider it. That just happened a couple years ago. Um, so now it's uh, salvia rosemarinus, I believe, is, is the Latin binomial of this plant as well. Also in the mint family, just like the time that we talked about. Catnip in the mint family. The mint family is huge, and we're going to talk about a lot of plants in the mint family, I guess. Um, catnip, you know, it's like many other things in the mint family, it makes a wonderful tea. It's a nice soothing tea. It's good for digestion, um, stomach upsets. It's a calming herb, uh, most certainly. But here at Small House, we actually harness the power of catnip, uh, most specifically in an alcohol extraction for uh, bug repellent as part of our insect repellent spray. Um, catnip, the essential oils of catnip repel bugs from 13 different families of insect. And I'm not an entomologist, so I can't name 13 families of insects, but I live in the middle of the woods and I tell you what, um, it's some potent stuff. It works quite well. Sage, again in the mint family. Salvia from the Latin Salvaire to save. Um, and they say, why would a man die who has sage in his garden, right? Um, we're potent, astringent. We use this as a mouthwash. Um, Titans and Tones, it's delicious. Lavender, Lavendula, Lavar to wash. Um, again, it's an antiseptic herb. Um, you can use it to cleanse wounds. Uh, prior to World War I, we actually would use lavender in American hospitals to wash surfaces. That's how powerful that it is. Um, but most people know lavender for its calming, soothing properties. Hops, this is the first one on the list that's not in the mint family. Um, hops is also very calming and soothing herb. We use it in tincture form uh, as an alcohol extract, um, and it is a powerful sleep aid. It will help you get some rest, that's for sure. Uh, you'll see a lot of folk herbalists, they'll use um, their McPillows, sleep sachet type of things, they'll put hops in it. Um, but yeah, an alcohol extraction of that is going to be, it's going to be very relaxing. And these are local allies, right? So I, I got some local plants that we don't cultivate that we're going to talk about. And I use the word allies. I use that intentionally because herbs are not commodities. Herbs aren't just products to buy and sell. Herbs are our allies. They are our partners. They are our teammates in our effort for a better world, right? Uh, we have a synergistic relationship with these plants. We take care of the plants, the plants take care of us. And I, I like to use this, this terminology because it helps keep it top of mind when we work with herbs that it's not just our ownership over plants, that it's an equal partnership that we work together. And when we honor and respect the plants that we work with, I feel that they craft more potent medicine. Stinging nettle, Urtica dioica. Now, if you can look at stinging nettles up close, you'll see the, 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 the hairs, the trichomes along the other side of the plant. Um, and if you can look at it under a microscope, you see each one of these hairs is a little tiny uh, sphere of formic acid and histamines. Uh, formic acid is very similar to like a red ant bite. And when you brush up against these stinging nettles, it stings and it burns, right? This is that plant's defense mechanism. Um, and while that can be certainly uncomfortable, it is also a potent medicine, right? Uh, nettles is fantastic. So you open up the capillaries to get blood flowing. It's great for arthritis and pain relief. Um, Roman soldiers used to flog each other with nettles to, to increase the circulation, to get each other pumped up for war. Uh, it's an amazing plant. When it's young, it's delicious and nutritious. Um, the, the stems can be made into cordage. It's just like a hemp plant. You can make fibers out of it. Nettles is awesome in every way. Jewelweed, which is an impatient, a touch-me-not, right? So when the seed heads, you know, when they're formed, if you touch them, it's part of the dispersal mechanism. It just launches these seeds all over the place. Uh, which is pretty cool. But jewelweed has a sap in the stems, which is fantastic for poison ivy. Now, I use it as a treatment for poison ivy, and I find that the easiest way to do this is to take the plant itself, pour it in a blender with a little bit of water, and then just put that into ice cube trays. And then if you stumble into some poison ivy, you can pop up one of these ice cube trays. It's cooling, it's gentle, it's, it's, it's healing, it's, it's a really nice medicine if you're at home. Right, if you have that convenience, you can have to take it on the road. If you're going to want to make a salve with it, it's fat soluble, certainly, and, and the, a topical salve or oil is going to be great for poison ivy. But I have read of indigenous populations 
actually using jewel weed as a preventative, putting the jewel weed sat before they went out into the woods to help stop poison ivy from happening, from, from being inflicted by poison ivy. Um, I have yet to put that to the test. I'm a little anxious about it, um, you know, but the people that have been using these herbs on this land for thousands of years before I got here probably know what they're talking about. So I'm going to say that's a pretty safe bet. Witch hazel, Hamamelis virginiana is the witch hazel that grows here in Michigan. Um, it flowers in the fall. It's flowered right now. It's absolutely gorgeous. If it was, um, if we were all together, we would be going to look at this plant in person because it's just, I go, it's gorgeous. I'm in love with it. Um, it makes a great astringent toner. Um, that's the, the product I'm going to show you here in a little bit. Is this astringent toner that we make from witch hazel. It's wonderful for uh, bruises and abrasions and cuts and scratches. But most people that actually buy it off of our website um, use it as a face wash. It tightens and tones the skin. It's great for acne. Um, it's probably the most popular product that we make. And I'm going to talk you right through making your own. Because um, my ultimate goal is obviously just put myself out of business. If you guys could make these things, then you wouldn't need me to make them. Um, and everyone would be a little bit more empowered. So that's what we're going to do. Goldenrod. Mm, goldenrod's all over the place right now, too. Uh, goldenrod is uh, great for a tincture or allergies. A lot of people want to give goldenrod a hard time, you know, for its allergies. But once you study your plants a little bit, you learn that goldenrod does not cause that. It's ragweed that does that. The pollen from goldenrod is so heavy, it barely travels at all. Whereas ragweed that drops its pollen around the same time, it's very light easily is, is moved about to, to irritate people. Um, and because Mother Nature provides for our every need, we know that the goldenrod itself is actually the medicine that we need to help with these symptoms that we get from these seasonal allergies. So a tincture from goldenrod is the bee's knees for that sort of thing. Elderberry. Everybody here is probably familiar with elderberry. Most certainly it's an antiviral. Um, people like to use it for cold and flu and such. Um, we've been making our products actually from elder flowers. It's a lot easier to work with. Um, I don't have to battle the birds for it, that sort of thing. And the flowers from elderberry, the, the, the active chemical components that we're looking for can be found in the flowers as well. So I can make just as powerful of a medicine with a lot less work on my part. And it's a delicious floral flavor. We generally use it as a tincture. Mullen, uh, well, I like to call it the toilet paper plant. Well, my son's told me I'm not allowed to tell that story, so we'll have to leave that one for another day. Um, but you know, the mullet is a nice, soft, soft rose in this rosette. Now, the law of signatures would lead us to understand this is an old fashioned herbal philosophy that plants resemble the body parts that they're good to heal, right? And if you look at a mullet leaf, many people believe that it resembles a lung, uh, the human lung. And lo and behold, it makes a wonderful medicine for lung congestion uh, and uh, other breathing related ailments, right? Now, if you're going to make a tea for mullen, it's very fibrous and hairy, and you want to strain, strain this out really, really well. Because um, if you get those little hairs in your tea and you drink it, you're going to be worse off than when you started. It's a terrible irritant. So make sure that it is well strained beverage, and then it's going to be good medicine. It's a biennial plant. The second year, it puts up that flower stalk um, with the familiar little yellow flowers that you'll see, which up close kind of resemble the human ear. And we know that uh, a fat extraction, an oil extraction um, made into drops from mullein flowers is fantastic for ear infections. Fantastic. Yarrow, Achillea millifolium. We talked about this plant already. Um, I've said so many things you may not remember what I said. Yarrow is uh, styptic, it helps stop bleeding on contact. You could take a yarrow leaf, chew it up, put it onto a cut and it will stop bleeding. It's like nature's band-aid. It's also antiseptic, so it's wonderful for cleaning the wound. And there she is, the beautiful wintergreen. One of my favorite of all the herbs. Uh, I don't have time to get into that story, I suppose, again. Um, but I love her so much, you know. It's the most patriotic of all beverages. Here's the side story. I'm a storyteller, so you're going to get some stories. Um, back in colonial America, um, we had a beef with the king in England about taxation of tea. I don't know if you're familiar with that. 
Um, I don't know if you've seen Hamilton or anything, um, but we had a beef over tea and we didn't want to drink any tea and we threw the tea, right? Um, so we don't want to pay taxes, no taxation for, without representation. So the alternative here at the time to tea was actually a fermented wintergreen beverage. That was the number one colonial tea at the time when we were striking against tax tea. So really it is, it is the most patriotic thing that we could drink is wintergreen tea. That is uh, a, a colonial delight that I still enjoy to this day. Um, now, if you're gonna make a tea from wintergreen, once you harvest the wintergreen, you'll see that it's a, it's a very thick, uh, glossy leaf. So breaking those leaves apart are gonna help you extract the chemicals much quicker, especially if you wanna make a tea out of it um, and you don't wanna wait all day, break these leaves, cut them up into pieces, give yourself a little more surface area, uh, bust down those cell walls, and you'll get a nice flavorful beverage in, in uh, maybe five minutes of steeping time. As opposed to if you don't break the leaves, you're gonna to wanna to steep your herbs back for 12 hours. Chequeed, Stellaria media, amongst the stars. Um, as you can see, look at this flower. Oh my gosh, isn't that gorgeous? Chickweed comes out early in the spring. You'll find it again in the fall some places. It enjoys cool weather. Um, the, the chemical components are mostly fat soluble and they make a fantastic topical rub for itches, rashes, um, any sort of dry skin scenario. Uh, Chickweed's gonna be your go-to for that. St. John's wort. Um, as a side note, just for fun, because I'm a seed guy, uh, one St. John's wort plant will produce 15,000 seeds. So if you see some St. John's wort, you're going to see lots of St. John's wort real soon. It produces quite quickly, reproduces itself quite quickly. Um, so that's a fun plant. Uh, hyperichum perforatum. It's hyperichum, it's so the hyperricin is the chemical in here that when you harvest it, actually you'll see it turns your fingers and it'll stain your fingers red. Uh, it's beautiful. That's the chemical in action. Um, so if you make a product from this, whether it's oil or tincture or whatever kind of extract that you use, that color comes out right away. Just beautiful, beautiful coloration. Um, now St. John's work got really popular in the 90s as an antidepressant medication. A lot of people are using it as a mood stabilizer or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the science is really out on that. You know, there's some anecdotal, anecdotal evidence, I suppose, for that. But they sold so many supplements in the 90s, and then they came back, because none of that stuff's even USDA inspected, you know, the stuff that they're selling. And they came back and they actually ran some, some tests on some of these products being sold. And many of them didn't even have St. John's Ward in it anyways, what they were selling. If that's not an argument towards local herbs, I don't know what is, right? Um, but that aside, there's many complications that could arise from the ingestion of St. John's wort and the way that it interacts with prescribed medications. So we're not, I'm not recommending anybody doing that anyways. What I'm going to recommend that you do with St. John's wort is use it topically, right? Uh, topically uh, in an oil extraction, a fat extraction. It's one of the most potent things I've come across for nerve pain. Um, any sort of pain, but nerve pain in particular, topical application of St. John's wort oil. Um, is what I recommend to everybody. We had a lady in the next town over that bought some products for me, an elderly lady. She was doing Tai Chi in the park with her friends. She shared some with her friends and they came back. They said it was the best for the nerve pain in her back, the best thing she'd ever used in her life. Um, so the next year I made it exclusively for her. I wasn't even making it for anybody else, but this lady enjoyed it so well. And that, that experience has kind of snowballed into a number of people now that have come back and had such great results with it. So there's my recommendation to you. Selfiel Prudella vulgaris. Uh, now this you'll see growing all over New York. It's kind of late spring, early summer. Beautiful little flowers in the mint family, as you can tell by the square stem. And uh, now Selfiel, as you can see by the common name there, is been prescribed over time as kind of a heal-all type of thing. It's good for this, it's good for that. Um, you know, in, in, in med medieval herbalism, it was believed to be a heal-all for so many things. Um, which may or may not be true, um, but I find it to be fantastic for a sluggish liver. Um, I enjoy using it as a tonic herb. I'll brew it in tea or as a tincture, um, and I find it really revitalizes my system. It gives me the energy I need to get going um, come springtime. So here's the, the wrap up on the slides, I think is where we're getting here. Uh, we want to think local, buy local, be local. And again, that's uh, my mantra with every topic that we'll come across. I'm going to say this to you. Um, 
I think that is the, one of the most impactful things that we can do for ourselves and our communities is to, to slow down and, and, and centralize our, our perspective on the area right around us, right? Instead of being so distracted by all of this, if we just focused on our neighbors and ourselves and the plants in our bioregion, I think we'd accomplish great, great things. So I think that's all of my slides for the moment. We should move on to making some tea. So we should pause here and see if anybody's got any questions, Pam. Uh, ben, we have one in the comments. Uh, she's asking, if, is jewel weed still effective when dried or does it need to be fresh? It's gonna be best when used fresh. Um, and, and that's a great question because with many herbs, I'll recommend people using it dry, um, especially if we're gonna use it in an oil extraction. You know, oil and water doesn't mix and using a dried herb in an oil extraction is gonna prolong the shelf life of the product. But with jewel weed, you're gonna have actually much better success infusing it in the oils when harvested fresh. That's an awesome question. Is that the only question? Yeah, so far. Oh, fantastic. Um, super cool. So the first thing that we're gonna do then is make some tea. I need something to drink. So we're gonna make a water infusion. We're gonna kind of go through order. We're gonna do uh, teas, tinctures, oils. That's how we're gonna go. We're gonna craft them right here with my goodies on the table and my hidden props that I've got. We're gonna see how this goes. Um, virtual herb demonstrations are relatively new to me. Uh, normally, this is something in person and you guys can sample all these things. So I'm gonna to try to keep it simple and slow, um, as slow as I can go. Uh, so again, questions when they come up, let's do it. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna make our, our water extraction. We're gonna make ourselves a cup of tea. When we're making a cup of tea, uh, we need to start with a tea ball, right? So I got a various sizes and and packages and stuff of different ways that we could make our tea, depending on the quantity of the beverage that we want to make, right? Um, these things are relatively inexpensive, these stainless steel contraptions, and they come in all different ways. Ones that open and close, some that are like trap balls. These ones here, they're like pinchy dues. I like these, but I always find that over time they bend and then they don't close up just right. And that drives me nuts. So we're going to use this one right here. Now, when I talk about herbal tea, a lot of the times uh, people think about tea, oh, man, it smells good. which is this plant right here, Camellia sinensis. Now, when you drink tea, green tea, brown tea, black tea, white tea, all those things known as tea, made from the tea plant, which is this plant right here. And we get all those different products that I just mentioned based on the way that the plant is harvested, cured, and processed. We'll produce all these different types of tea. But that all comes from Camellia sinensis, not technically an herbal tea. So today's herbal tea that we're gonna make is gonna be from mint. I thought that'd be good. I got a great harvest of mint. Um, now when we harvest our herbs, you know, we wanna pick them at the peak of their flavor. So I always recommend people harvest their herbs right as their plants begin to flower, right? If we're, if we're dealing with the above ground portions of the plant, the stems, the flower, the leaves, that sort of thing, um, the aerial portions, we want to harvest right as the plant begins to flower. It's putting all of its energy into that upper portion of the plant, therefore you're going to get the most potent stuff. Um, obviously if you're harvesting to, to dry for winter storage like we've done here, uh, wait till after the dew has dried and all that sort of thing so you don't have all that water on your plants when you set them to dry. You can take your herbs and make them into bundles and hang them to dry. Um, but I find too much herb in a bundle doesn't get enough airflow through the inside and the inside will tend to mold. Um, so if you're going to do that, work with small bundles and put them someplace where you're sure you're going to get a little airflow. Um, be it by a window maybe, uh, a little fan, whatever it might be to get them to dry. We don't bother with that anymore. They look cool. We do it sometimes as decorations, uh, but we use just screens. I've got like screen doors. Uh, saw horses. Now we've built like a whole rack system that we've got. We, we put all of our herbs out on screens to dry. And that, so you can see, you know, I don't know if you can really tell in the video, but this is a vibrant green herb. I mean, I can tell by looking at it what it is. That's mint for sure. So we're going to garble it out, which just means, you know, getting it cleaned up, getting all the stems and all that junk out of the way. And we've got our stuff here. For brewing a cup of tea, we're going to want a tablespoon to two tablespoons of herb, on average, right? Now this is just for an enjoyable beverage. If you're making an herbal medicinal blend, you're gonna to wanna to use more tea or more herb, you know, to uh, make a more potent beverage. 
I'm going to use hot water to extract the chemicals from my plant material. And I'm going to let it steep, again, for my delicious beverage, about three to five minutes. And you'll be able to tell when the tea is ready, of course, because the aroma of the herb will be released. You'll be able to smell it. The color of the water will change. And like I said, these are all signals that the chemicals are being released. They're being extracted by our menstruum into our product here. If you're looking to make something medicinal, of course, you're going to want to use a larger amount of herb in your ratio of herb to water. And um, you're going to want to steep it for a longer. When I make medicinal brews, I will use a quart jar. And I will cap it off and I'll put it in the fridge overnight. Give it like 24 hours to steep. You're going to get a real potent extraction that way. And uh, you're going to, you know, it's going to be a better mess. But anyways, we're making some tea. So we're just going to do it real quick. So again, for every six to eight ounces of water, one to two tablespoons of herb. Now, you just watched me do that. I did not measure what I was doing. Um, but I know from experience that these tea balls will hold about two tablespoons of herb. So that's what we got. So we're going to let that steep for three to five minutes. And I'm going to get to enjoy it. Um, again, like I mentioned, water infusions aren't always for tea. They're not always for drinking. Sometimes we're going to use it as a wash. Sometimes we're going to use it um, in our hair or on our skin, whatever it might be. Sometimes we're going to make something a little bit more potent, right? Now, when we make uh, our infusions out of leaves and, 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 and flowers and gentle, soft things, things with a small cellular wall. This infusion process is going to work really well. When we're working with things like roots, bark, hard-coated seeds, right? We have a very thick, hard cellular wall. Just a simple infusion isn't going to break these plants down the way that we need them. So we're going to use a process known as decoction. Now, decoction sounds fancy, but essentially what we're doing is we're boiling the herbs uh, to break down that plant material to get it to release its stuff. Now here, this is the witch hazel product that I was telling you about that we make. Um, and this is made with the bark and some leaves, but mostly the uh, inner bark of the Hamamelis virginiana plant. Um, and we gather that up. Indigenous, indigenous medicine makers would harvest it in the fall as the plants are flowering. So right now would be when they would make the most potent stuff. Um, Due to my limited ability to make a big batch and the demand for it on our website, I've made it throughout the year in different stages of the plant's life, and I've not noticed the difference in the product that we create. Um, it still gets the same beautiful red color, kind of oily, looking slick to the top of it. And we'll boil that. We'll we'll chop the plant up, chop the chop the bark up into small pieces. You want to give yourself as much surface area as you can to break this stuff down. And um, I'll I'll boil it for 12 to 24 hours, depending. Uh, and how large the batch is, uh, but really to break that down and to release the medicine into the menstruum, right? And then for that product, we'll actually add alcohol to it. We're not making a, a alcohol extraction by any means, but we add alcohol to it about 8% um, as a preservative to keep it shelf stable, right? Because if you think about just a, um, a tea, if it's around for a couple of days, it's not going to be good anymore. Uh, so we add that alcohol to it to make it shelf stable as a preservative. But it's actually the product itself is just a decoction, water infusion, just like this tea that I made right here. Delicious. Okay. Now, that's our water infusion. Real basic stuff, simple things. So we're going to move along to the next thing, unless there's a, a burning question at this point. Okay. Nope, so not hearing anything. Not Fantastic. Anything. Let's move along then. Uh, we are going to move into tinctures. Just like in the slides, I'm going to try to go in that same order. Now, a tincture, again, is an alcohol extraction. Um, the choice of alcohol is pretty much open. You know, um, I use vodka because it's clear, it has very little scent, and very little flavor, which means that the, the properties of the herb that I'm working with are going to stand up on top um, and that matters to me if you dig into some old herbals you'll find that many many times they would use brandy as as the alcohol for extraction sometimes even wine um, and the reasoning for this i believe is just simply availability that's what they had available to them um, so that's what they were using 
what matters more than the choice of alcohol is the potency of the alcohol, right? The alcohol content. You're going to want something that's uh, 100 proof, if you can, is probably best, uh, which is 50% alcohol, 50% water, right? Um, you want it strong enough to, to do the job. So in this case, we're going to be using vodka. There's my jar of vodka that I'm going to use today. Um, I don't recommend using wine like you read about in the old herbals because the wine is like 14%. It doesn't have enough alcohol to properly extract the chemical components um, to, to, to do the job that you're looking to do when we're making these types of products. All right, so we got our vodka. Now we need our herb. Uh, we are going to use, I got a good haul of lemon balm, and I think we're going to use that. I had a lady get a hold of me the other day. Now, I use lemon balm mostly for, it's, it's antiviral. It is great for cold and flu, fantastic for cough. Uh, it's good for lung health, right? So in the time of COVID-19, uh, lemon balm is kind of my go-to herb right now for a number of things. I use it in my evening teas as often as I can. But I had a lady get a hold of me who used lemon balm on her own for migraine headaches. And she was having great success with that. But she recently moved, hadn't established her garden this year, and did not have any lemon balm. So she asked me to craft a lemon balm tincture for her for her migraine headaches. and. Um, that's what we're going to do now. So I'll let her know that you guys all helped. So again, I'm just going to garble my plants. I'm going to get a bunch of these stems and things out of the way, get down to the leaf. All right, let's see how much of this am I going to want to make. I'm going to make quite a bit. So actually, I'm going to change my process. We are going to, now there's a couple of different ways that we can go about making a tincture. And this depends upon you and your preference and what your overall goal is, right? Uh, now, the, the, the first technique is what's known as the folk method, right? And in the folk method, it's kind of loosey-goosey, where we are going to take our herbs and we're going to fill it up in our jar. And then we're going to top it off with our vodka up to about here. I like to fill it up so there's about two fingers of vodka past the plant material. to Make sure that the plant material is not exposed to the air, right, um, to get a good extraction. And this tends to work just fine, and this is the way that people have made herbal medicine for a long, long time. If you're making herbal medicine commercially, if you plan on offering it to friends and family in your community, and you want to make products that you can reproduce over and over again, you're going to want to take some measurements, right? The ratio. A lot of tinctures are made at a ratio of one to two, right? For every one part of herbs, there are two parts alcohol menstruum. The trick here is that your herbs are measured by weight and your vodka, your menstruum is measured by volume, right? So if you're using American measurements of ounces, um, it's very important that you pay attention to the fact the difference between volume and weight, right? When we get to making our salves, I'm going to give you the very specific ratio that we use. Um, and I will reiterate again the difference between weight and volume to ensure that we can reproduce our product time and time again. But for this demonstration, we're making the folk method here. Man, this smells really good. Oh, it smells good. Oh, look at all these seeds everywhere. Hold on one second. I got to move those off to the side. All right. So we're going to top, get our jar all filled up with our lemon balm, just like this. This is our plant material here, as you can see. I'm going to take my vodka, and I'm going to fill it up, like I said, two fingers past where the plant material is at. Oh, that doesn't smell as good anymore. Almost perfect, look at that. All right, then, we're going to take a chopstick, some sort of device like this, whatever it may be. We're going to kind of poke our plants around to, to get the air bulbs out of there, to work that air. We don't want air down in here. Air harbors bacteria. we got to get it out. All right? We're going to pop that around like this, get all the air out. 
and then we're going to cap it. So I didn't bring a cap, so we're just going to have to pretend. We're going to cap it, and we're going to date it. We have to label this. Just like with everything that we do in life, labeling is key to success, right? Properly labeled herbal medicines. We want to put on here the herb that we're working with, the menstruum that we're using, the proof of the alcohol that we're using, right? And the date. Now, we can either use today's date or the date when the product's going to be finished. Either one is fine. However you like to organize that is fine, but you have to be consistent. Whatever you decide that you're going to do, you have to be consistent and continue to do that so you don't get confused. What's the date when this is going to be finished? You're going to want to let your tincture work for four to six weeks, right? So we're going to cap it off. We're going to label it. Today's date and the date four to six weeks from now. We're going to put it in a cool, dark place, off in a cupboard somewhere to work. Give it a couple of days if you want to get it out and shake it around, that sort of thing. You're more than welcome to. Um, but four to six weeks, you're going to want to let this sit. After six weeks, it can continue to sit like this. As long as the plant material is below the level of the alcohol and is not exposed to the air, you can let this thing sit indefinitely. And it's not going to go bad. But it's not going to get any more potent, right? So... Just keep that in mind as you make your stuff. Make a label, cap it, label it, label it, label it. And then set it away for four to six weeks. Hey Ben, we have a yep. couple of questions related to this. Okay. I think you answered the first one, uh, how much alcohol by volume? And you said 100 proof, preferably, right? Preferably 100 proof. Now, if we're working with herbs that are, uh, well, I shouldn't say herbs. When we're working with, say, uh, resins, spices, uh, myrrh, things like, you know, uh, you're going to want to use a more potent alcohol. If you could get Everclear, something like that, um, that's going to work better for that. But in most scenarios, what most of us are doing at home, 100 proof is going to be perfect. Okay, the second question is, do you ever make tinctures with a ratio of weight of herb to weight of alcohol? I do not, uh, but you could, I suppose. The, the key is just consistency. However you choose to measure your ingredients is up to you. Whatever's gonna work best for you, whatever's gonna work um, in your scenario is fine. But you have to be consistent with that and make notes, write that down. You know, and that's the thing I probably should have covered right away is get yourself a notebook, whether it's like a, you know, a, a mead school notebook or a fancy journal, whatever it is, um, get something and write in it all the time, right? Write all these things down, you know? Um, so if you choose to measure things by weight, you, it's not conventional, certainly, um, to measure your liquid by weight, but you can well, write that down. So that way, you know, when you come back, you can reproduce that if somebody else is using your recipe, they can reproduce that as well. Um, that's perfectly fine. You know, with this notebook, like when we drink these teas, when we make a tea, the reason I made a mint tea with one herb is really is an educational demonstration, I suppose, right? I think that when you begin down the path of herbalism, working with one herb at a time is the best way to go, especially with a tea. You know, pick an herb, brew it into a tea, and make notes in your notebook. Write it down, you know, the flavors, the, the sensations, the smells, everything. Notes throughout the whole thing. It may seem like, like a, a, a labor, a chore at the, at the time, but when we come back to look at it, it's going to, uh, hindsight's 2020. You're going to look back at your notes and you're going to be like, oh, I see what I've learned here and I understand it so much more. Okay, we got some more questions. Sure. Um, Fresh versus dried herbs. So most cases, like I said earlier, when we talked about jewelweed, I'm going to recommend dry herbs, um, especially when we're dealing with oils, like, you know, because oil and water don't mix. When we're dealing with tinctures, it's not quite as important. And in some cases, you know, you can certainly use fresh herbs. If you're going to use fresh herbs, though, you want to make sure that they're dry, literally dry, you know, that they don't have dew or rain or anything on them. And some, some plants, especially the flowers and things like that, hold a lot of moisture inside of them. So let them sit around after you harvest them just a little bit, let them wilt, let some of that water kind of evaporate out of the plant um, is gonna help it be more potent. Dry herbs are significantly more potent than fresh herbs, simply because of the water content. And can you use anything besides 
to alcohol to bake these tinctures? You can. Um, some people will use glycerin to make tinctures, like non-alcoholic versions of a tincture, um, especially when they're dealing with making medicinals for children. Uh, some adults yeah. don't want to get into it. Glycerin, right? <laughs> or yeah, vinegar, you know, for sure. Um, whether it's for kids or whether it's adults that abstain from alcohol or whatever it may be, those are certainly non-alcoholic options. But we have to keep in mind that a glycerin-based tincture is not going to have a shelf life of an alcohol-based tincture, um, and it's not going to be as potent, you know, and that's just the nature of it, you know, but you, they certainly can be made if, if that's preferred. It's just keeping those things in mind. If you're going to make a glycerin tincture, I'd say put it in the fridge. And we have a question about your book. Will be some of these recipes or, or um, instructions for making things be in your new book that's coming out? Yes, actually. Um, so the book, you know, a, a big bulk of the book is a number of plants. And we talk about, um, you know, mythology and uses and, and history and all these things of these plants. But it does include um, a, an entire chapter on formulas, recipes for not only just tinctures in general, but specific formulas for making different products for different ailments. Um, so, yes, yeah, there's a lot of recipes in there. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. So you can move along. Here we go. So now we're going to fast forward. Now we're four to six weeks later and our tincture has been sitting here um, and it's properly extracted. All right. Uh, this is actually a self heal. This is a Prunella tincture. Uh, and this, because of my proper labeling, I can tell you was made on July 17th, 2019. That's when all this went into the jar here. Um, so it's hit the six week mark easily. Uh, it hasn't gotten any more potent since then. But as you can see, it still keeps just fine because the plant material is below the alcohol. So once your tinctures are ready to go, you're going to want to get some sort of a strainer of some sort. I recommend these guys. You can get this like at a brew supply place online or if you have a local brew supply store, these things are fantastic. It's a giant funnel. But what I love about it the most is it's got this really fine mesh screen inside, which is removable for easy cleaning, but awesome. Right, so you know, you're gonna get yourself another container and we're gonna use, let's see what container say here. We'll do this one. And we're gonna simply filter this stuff, right? Strain it off. Let's see how it goes. Ooh. Now see, I should be taking notes in my herbal notebook right now on the smells. It's incredibly floral. Um, which is not what you'd expect from 100 proof vodka, right? Um, and you can see, look at, you see the coloration in there? You can tell this is a good extraction. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, we're gonna wanna get all the plant material out of here. And the plant material itself, especially because we use dried herbs, are gonna hold on to a lot of that liquid, a lot of that menstrual that's in there, right? And we don't wanna waste it, we gotta get it out. So we got a couple of options for how we want to go about doing this. You could use a tincture press. If you just happen to have some cash and you like to shop for equipment, um, you can buy, it's called a tincture press right on the internet. Um, and it will do the job of essentially squeezing this stuff out. Um, what I find works really well, which is very similar to a tincture press, is a French press for coffee. Um, very, very similar, a third of the price. Um, that's a good option, right? But yeah, maybe you don't have that. Everybody's got one of these potato mashes though. You know what I'm saying? Um, and you could just, you're just squeezing this plant material to get every last drop of that good stuff out of there. Now I've got a press right over there, but we're not using it because I want everybody to understand that herbalism is something that everybody can do regardless of the limitations in your budget your supplies, whatever it is, everybody can do it. If you don't have a funnel like this and you don't want to buy it, get yourself some cheesecloth. That's pretty inexpensive. Squeeze it by hand, all right? Everybody can do it. Uh, ooh wee, look at that. And I'm gonna put this. You know, so don't make a big mess with it. And just like that, I've got my tincture. Right, look at that, look at it. You can see the beautiful color in there. That's awesome stuff. 
Mm, sounds good. Now, where you go from here depends on what your, your ultimate goal is also. Um, if this is just for a home, for your friends and family, whatever it may be, you can cap this off just like this. Again, properly labeled. Label the date that you strained it. Label the, the, the plant, the alcohol menstruum. All of the information, again, goes on to this new label. And again, you're going to store it in a cool, dark place. And this will keep pretty much indefinitely. Uh, this is an incredible amount of medicine here. Um, tinctures, like I mentioned earlier, being so potent, the doses are, are significantly smaller. Right, we're talking like a dropper full at the most, usually less than that, typically uh, quarter teaspoon and up, depending on the plant. Um, so this right here would last. This is going to last forever. <laughs> this is going to be medicine for a long time. This is going to be shared. But if you're going to distribute it, if you're going to share it with folks. Um, if you're starting an herbal business or already have an herbal business, whatever that case may be, if you're trying to get it out into the public, uh, I recommend these dropper bottles. Right, you get these from SKS. SKS is the company you can order these from in bulk. Um, it's a nice dark glass, which helps protect your medicine from the light, right? Because you got to keep it cool and dark. And it comes with the screw off dropper top, right? Really, really handy stuff. So this is a two ounce bottle, and this is, well, this is 16 ounces of stuff. So I would need eight of these to bottle this up, right? Um, again, this is depending upon your particular scenario, what you're doing with yourself, um, and what your ultimate goal is. But labeling is the key, however you decide to have it. Tinctures. Okay, now, these are, these are actually tinctures from Small House. This one's a whorehound tincture that we make, uh, which is fantastic for um, cough. You know those whorehound candies that you can buy? Um, it's an old, old timey medicine for cough. Uh, we make a tincture with it, which is pretty, pretty good. And then this one here, oh, motherwort, Leonardo's Cardiaca. Um, now, motherwort, the name, the common name motherwort, wort just being an old English word for herb. Um, so, this is the mother herb. It's used a lot of the times for uh, female hormonal issues, menstruation, cramping, that sort of thing. But the Latin binomial, Leonardo's Cardiaca, talks to the long history of use of this herb for heart health. So that's a pretty good one. Um, that we put in those things. Now, these tinctures, oils. So this might get a little noisy, I don't know. I had this on at the beginning and I turned it off because it was getting noisy. Uh, but I'm gonna turn this guy on here, this little uh, cooker over here, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, so hopefully it doesn't get, it's kind of sizzling, so we'll see what happens. Now we're gonna talk about oils and Oils, like I mentioned, can be used straight. You know, we infuse the oil. We're using fat as our menstrual now to extract the oil, or to extract the chemicals into the oil um, from the herbs, and we can use them topically just like that. Think of it as like um, a culinary salad dressing. Right? You can take your olive oil, pack some rosemary in there. The flavor of the rosemary is infused into the oil. You can use it on your salad, right? It's the same kind of concept. Once that flavor has been infused into the oil. That's how you know that the chemicals are coming out of the plant material. Now, if we're making something medicinal, obviously we're gonna use a significantly more herb to oil ratio uh, to make it more potent. Again, just like our tea versus our medicinal water infusion, it's the same type of thing, but the concept is exactly the same. So this is something that we can all do. Then we're gonna take our oils, and we're gonna make them portable with beeswax. That's what's gonna happen right here. So we'll get to that process in a second. First, let's make our oil. Um, yeah, we're going to make it. Okay. If you got a minute, Ben, um, somebody asked for St. John's wort. It, must it be a topical oil when you're using it for nerve pain? Well, it doesn't have to be an oil. Um, you can make it into a tincture. Now, anything that's fat soluble is typically also alcohol soluble, right? So you, you certainly could make it into a tincture, but as far as absorption into the skin, uh, that, that topical application, you're gonna have greater success and be able to cover a little more distance, you know, um, on the body with an oil. Um, but ingesting of the St. John's wort for pain it isn't, um, that's not gonna be as successful, no. Thank you. All right, so we're going to make some mint oil, I think. 
Now, you know, we know mint tea is good for um, stomach upset, digestive issues. Um, it's very calming in that sort of way. At the same time, the essential oil is invigorating and can pump you up, right? So, you know, mints can do a lot of different things for us. But topically, the, the menthone and menthol that can be found in peppermint is uh, analgesic, right? It's great for pain relief. So we're gonna make it a topical pain relief oil using our mint, all right? So it's the exact same process that we used for our tincture. We're going to put our herbs into our jar. We need more than that. Now in this scenario, again, you can use a weight to volume ratio if you want, or you can use the folk method. The folk method that we're gonna to use today is I'm literally gonna fill this jar up as high as I can go with plant material, and then we're gonna fill it up just past that with oil. That's our recipe. Man, that smells good too, holy smokes. I picked some good herbs to work with today, Pam. These are fantastic. Mm, I wish you guys were here so we could all smell it together. Woo, I'd be passing that around. All right. I forgot an important step. Hold on one second. I forgot my oil. Now, when you're dealing with oil, um, I like to talk about our oil choice a little bit. Um, just because of what we do at Small House where we produce oil, um, it's kind of helped me think about that a little bit more than if I was just buying it. You know, it, it's changed my thought process a little bit. So let's talk about that. You know, we choose the herbs, we choose the herbs that we use based on the chemical constituents, based on the effect that they're gonna have based on the medicine that we're trying to make, right? Um, and we're very particular about that. We wanna use the best stuff, locally grown, organic, whatever it may be, and I'm gonna use mint because of the chemicals are specifically for pain relief. That's, you know, I'm choosing that intentionally. And then people just grab whatever oil and put it in there. People use coconut oil or grapeseed oil or God forbid, soybean oil, olive oil, whatever it may be. And again, it's gonna come back to those medieval herbalists and how they use brandy simply because it was available People tend to use whatever oil is available, and I guess that's fine. But we can enhance our herbal products if we think of the fact that all of these oils are made from plants. So just like our herbs have particular properties that we're choosing, the oils also have particular properties that we can choose. All right? That's interesting when we think about that. So I could use what would be nice, I suppose, to be using right now, maybe in a pain relieving ointment, would be um, some hemp oil. The hemp seed oil that we produce would be excellent for that. Um, the sunflower oil that's right here is high in vitamin E, so it's wonderful for a topical application for something on the skin, because you know vitamin E being an essential nutrient for the skin. Choosing these oils and considering them as a part of the process, I think enhances our herbal experience. We also have to think about how these herbs are being produced. These oils are being produced, excuse me, how these oils are being produced. Um, the oils that we make here at Small House are cold pressed, they're expeller pressed oils. They're, they're pressed at a temperature below 170 degrees to maintain the nutritional integrity of the oil, uh, the, the flavor profile, the, the viscosity, whatever it may be, um, is all there. A number of the oils that we may purchase at the grocery store are, are chemically extracted with hexane. Hexane is like two molecules away from being gasoline. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to put that on my body. I don't want to put that on the body of my friends and family, you know? Um, so making wise choices with our oils is just as important as making wise choices with our herbs. All right. Got our oil. Again, to just above the level of the plant material. And then we'll use our poking stick. Get all the air bubbles out. I'm going to cap it off. Well labeled with the herb that I used, the date that I did it, the oil that I used, and when it's going to be done. All right? 
And again, just like our tincture, we're going to put this away for four to six weeks. In a cool, dark place. Covered's nice. Don't put your oils over the uh, stove. A lot of people like to put their oils over the stove. Um, it's hot up there. It's not a terrible place for your oil to be at. It's going to cause it to go rancid. Cool and dark. Cool and dark is key. Then we'll fast forward. We'll fast forward four to six weeks and our oil is done. This is a well-infused herbal oil. This is the jewelweed oil, actually right here, as a matter of fact, the jewelweed that we harvested on September 13, 2019. So we know that it's good. Just like with the tinctures, it's not gonna get any more potent after six weeks, but as long as the plant material is submerged below the oil and not exposed to the air, it'll sit and it'll be just fine. So we're gonna to wanna to make a salve. Now, get your pencils ready. Like I mentioned at the beginning, the greatest difference between a salve, a balm, a lotion, and a cream is the ratio of oil to beeswax. Beeswax is what we're going to use to solidify our product. Beeswax is all natural, made by bees. You can get it all over the place. If you know a guy that's doing honey, um, your local apiary, that guy's pretty much buried in beeswax. Uh, he cleans it out all the time, and there's not a big enough market for it. So make friends with your local beekeeper and he'll probably get you a great deal on some beeswax right here, all right? It also smells great, I think. Now the difference between the balm, the lotion, the salve is the ratio. The ratio that I'm gonna give you to begin with is the salve ratio that we use. For every 16 ounces of volume of oil, 16 ounces of volume, you will use 1.25, one and a quarter ounces of weight of beeswax. 16 ounces volume, oil, one and a quarter ounces weight for beeswax. And then based on the amount of product and oil that you have, you can slide that ratio any direction that you need to go, right? That's our basic ratio. That'll make, we make our salves for our website in these one ounce containers, and that'll make 20 of these. We'll make 20 ounces of final product. But we're dealing with a much smaller amount of stuff. So we're gonna have to weigh it out. So get yourself a digital scale if you can, all right? That's just a prop, I've already weighed these out. Um, we're gonna go with, I'm gonna fill up this four ounce container. So we're gonna go, I need my strainer. So we'll strain our oil out. I'm gonna cheat and only strain out exactly what I need though for the demonstration. Look at that green color. Oh my goodness. We're going to go with three ounces of oil is what we're going to do here to make our four ounce container, which I had a lot more than that. And then what we're going to do is if you have a double boiler, you're all set. I do not have a double boiler, which is ironic if you think about it because um, I make salves for a living and I've never even invested in one. What I got here is a hot plate. For the demonstration, you could obviously use your stove top with a pot of water and a metal stainless steel bowl on top. See that? Uh, use a hot pad. And I'm telling you from experience, uh, that thing's gonna get hot. Don't touch it. Right? So I'm going to take my three ounces of oil, or whatever your measurement may be, and I'm going to add it to my double boiler. Then I'm going to take my ratio of beeswax, add it to the double boiler. And I'm going to take my fancy poking stick, again, I mean, you get this at the dollar store, I suppose. I've used it for every demonstration, so this must be an essential tool. And we're occasionally going to stir our stuff while it cooks, all right? All we're doing here is we're melting the beeswax. We're going to stir it until the beeswax melts. Some folks like to use essential oils in their products. 
Um, if that is the case for you, you want to add them at the very, very end of this process. Uh, ben, somebody has a question about uh, sunflower oil. She said, Robin says, sunflower oil used to be popular 40 years ago, and now it's hard to find. What is a good place to source it that doesn't cost $4.99 a pound? <laughs> It's a fantastic question. Um, you know, I, I wonder if Mountain Rose Herb sells it. Uh, we press sunflower oil, um, so I don't really buy enough of it to know the answer to that. Um, but I will say this, when you're searching for it, I would start at Mountain Rose Herbs, but maybe Bulk Oil, I think bulk, that's a website, uh, nuts.com, something like that. But the key is that you're going to want to make sure that you get, oh, I see that bulk apothecary sells it, but it's expensive. Um, expeller pressed. That's the key. Um, it's more expensive to produce it that way because the, 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 the return is less. As far as, you know, if I use hexane, I'm going to get more oil than if I use an expeller press. Uh, but the quality is so much more that if they're expeller pressing it, it's going to be on the label. So that's what you want to look for. Uh, you want to make sure that it's not a chemically extracted oil um, and you will pay a little bit more for it that way um yeah bulk apothecary mountain rose herbs for some reason i want to say nuts.com i feel like they might sell oils you can always visit my website i don't sell it in bulk but um you can buy some of our cold pressed sunflower oil it's the best. <laughs> All right, so now my beeswax has melted in my double boiler here, right? So I'm gonna turn off the heat and using my hot pad, yeah. I'm gonna gently take this guy off of here. I'm gonna make sure I give it a good stir so that the beeswax is all distributed throughout my oil. And then I'm gonna pour it into my container here, trying to keep it off the table. Look at that, now that was, Good measurements, because I filled that jar up just right. I'll put that back up there and let that cool. Now, as my salve cools at room to down to room temperature, that beeswax will begin to harden a bit. And as it's well distributed th throughout that oil, it's going to turn this into a firm salve product that then I can apply wherever I may need it. Just that easy. Just make sure you're careful. So start with the ratio that I gave you, make the product. See how it turns out for you. Some people like it a little more stiff, some people like it softer, and adjust your ratio based on your own experience. But that's a good starting point. Um, 16 ounces of volume to one and a quarter ounces of weight of beeswax. Um, start there, and that'll give you a good uh, jumping off point. To move yourself forward. Does anybody have any questions about that specific activity? Fantastic. I got a couple more slides I'm going to bust off with real quick here, um, and then we'll move and see if there's additional Q&A. See, if you guys were here, oh, I wish you guys were here. Here's the lotion that we make. I just would like to pass these things around to all of you so you can touch them and smell them. This breaks my heart that you can't. All right, to the slides. Back to this slide here. We might as well reiterate this point and how important thinking local, buying local, and being local is, right? But here's this. Um, this is just for you guys. This is an exclusive code uh, as in the library that we're dealing with, L-Y-O-N. If you visit smallhousefarm.com, that's my website, anything that you purchase from now through the end of the year, whatever it may be, books, salves, lotions, oils, whatever, T-shirts, we got some heirloom tomato T-shirts, whatever your heart desires. You can get on this website. You can use this coupon code when you check out. It'll give you 15% off. You can use as many times as you want um, for you and all of your friends. Um, do all your Christmas shopping, whatever you're into, you know. 15% um, off everything at smallhousefarm.com. So that's my gift to you guys because um, well, we all got to hang out together today, and that was super fun for me. There's a couple of uh, my books right here. This is a quick plug for my books. Um, these are my seed saving books. Um, this is a good time of the year to be thinking about harvesting and saving our garden seeds. Uh, so here's a couple books about that that we wrote. Saving Our Seeds has been amazingly popular. Baker Creek, so 
Heirloom Seed Company provided a lot of the photography for that book. So it's just gorgeous, really beautiful photography, as well as a very useful how-to manual. But this is the cat's meow right here, um, the artist and herbalist. So if you were into tonight's talk and you wanted to learn more outside of the hour and a half that we got to spend together, this book will teach you everything that you need to know, uh, how to make teas and tinctures and oils, all the herbs that you can work with, how to start an herbal business, the history of herbalism, so much stuff is packed into this book. Um, and again, the focus being that relationship on plants that grow in our yards and in our parks and in our fields and forests, uh, or that we already have right here in our kitchen. You know, nature's abundance is beneath our feet and at our fingertips everywhere that we go. And this book is kind of a guide to help get us through that. Um, you can pre-order it now via the Small House Farm website. It's also on there, theartisanherbalist.com. It's available there as well. And it's coming out spring of 21. Um, it was supposed to be February. I think it's actually going to be March now because of the COVID situation. But hey, spring of 21, that's still a pretty good time. So the Artisan Herbalist, if you're into that, check that out. And then this is it. That's all my uh, contact information so we can stay in touch with each other. Our Facebook and Instagram, that sort of fun stuff. YouTube channel, if you do that, you should check that out, man. That's been pretty fun. We've been doing a lot of that here, especially during lockdown. We kind of got into that. There's a lot of herbalism in there, foraging, seed saving, all the groovy stuff happening here at Small House ends up on YouTube now. So definitely check that out. And then of course, smallhousefarm.com. That's the ultimate place for everything Small House. Um, so those are all my slides, folks. So, so please stay in touch with me through these links. Um, if you're into the book, I would love that. That's super cool. Use the coupon code. I love you guys. Um, let's do some questions if you guys have any. Um, ben, before we start with the questions, I just want to thank the uh, Four Seasons Garden Club of South Lyon for co-sponsoring this program with us. Um, and um, we've got a couple more questions. One of them is, um, what is a balm? as opposed to, and what are the ratios for lotions and balms? And then what is a balm as opposed to a lotion, I guess? Sure. So now balm and salve are two words that kind of just get flip-flopped interchangeably. And balm is just simply, uh, it's an old word that kind of means a medicinal topical rub, right? Um, and so when I think of balms, I always think of like lip balms, right? The, the main difference between a salve and a balm is that a balm has more wax. It's a much stiffer product, right? Um, so think about a lip balm and how you rub it on your lips, something a little more firm, that kind of holds its body a little bit more. Um, whereas a salve has a little bit less, so it's a little bit softer, down to less beeswax, more oil is gonna give you a lotion, something that you're gonna be able to spread a little bit farther and is gonna absorb into your skin a little bit quicker. And uh... I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but Laura says adding essential oils to any of these products would be okay. Yes. If that is a question, the answer is yes, it would be okay. Um, we don't use a lot of essential oils here. That's why I didn't get too far into it, but certainly that you could. Um, now with the salve or what we're making over here with the oil, like I said, you add that at the very, very end. Um, if I was to add it at the beginning, it would all evaporate before I got my final product. So when it was ready and the beeswax was melted, turn off the heat, add your essential oil, mix it, pour it into containers, like right away. Um, and that's gonna give you the, the most potent and most well-distributed dose of essential oils in your product. Um, someone asked tins or jars, and I kind of had that same question, you know, glass versus something else. Is, is there a preference for longevity of the product? Well, not necessarily for longevity, um, but my preference leans towards glass. Um, the, the glass itself is gonna last forever, pretty much, and I can continually reuse that for at-home use. Um, commercially, obviously, we can't reuse packages. The reason that we use these tins um, is simply for convenience. Um, they're lightweight, they're very portable. Um, I can throw this into my backpack or my purse or whatever it might be and take it where I'm going, and it's just a little safer and uh, more convenient than a glass jar would be. And that's the only reason that we use those. Um, I shy away from plastic as often as possible. Um, sometimes plastics are a little more porous, um, but most of that's just a preference issue. I try to avoid plastic whenever possible. Um, so uh, how about and food, food grade oils are, um, 
generally okay if I guess you would, I don't know a food grade oil opposed to what maybe a, like a massage oil or I always use food grade everything I mean think about it like this your skin is your largest organ everything that you put on your skin is absorbed directly into your bloodstream um, if you wouldn't eat it you shouldn't put it on your body yeah and uh, I think we have a message from Brad he said essential oils tend to flash off with heat so you don't want to add it too soon yep that kind of echoes what I was saying you want to add that right at the very end right? just before you bottle it yeah exactly right uh, we've got quite a few people saying thank you um, great information uh, I, I you can I was hoping if you could take a look at the comments real quick so you can see uh, how many people are um, thank, thanking you and one says thank you for sharing your knowledge in an enthusiastic way and that's uh -huh. what I always think about Ben is he's always brings a lot of enthusiasm to his programs thank um, you guys man like I had so much fun I wish that you know maybe we could do this again sometime where we can get together although I know that you all came from so many different places which really is kind of the blessing of where we're at right now you know we have to look at the opportunities and our challenges and this is able to bring us all together from all these different places to learn together to share some time together uh, so thank you all for coming and being a part of this i really appreciate every one of you um oh we have one one more coming in um can you still harvest goldenrod because some of those blooms are starting to brown well yeah and i noticed that too because uh, you know at least here it got real cold real quick um you're going to want to obviously the best specimens you're going to want to harvest from if you can find some that are still very lively and colorful that's what you're going to want to harvest from um or vice versa you leave them and go to seed um i know i've read about some indigenous folks um uh, over in wisconsin that would actually harvest goldenrod seeds and and use them um to bake they would grind them and use it as a flower so if you're really industrious you could you could try that also um but as far as making the medicinal yeah make sure you can find some that are still lively and beautiful. yeah and, and there might be some air areas where the frost didn't hit as hard too um you know sure. a little more protected area you might be able to find some yep and i mean get out there and look around and if you don't find any at least you got to take a beautiful walk yeah well one of the well, and, and um it says thanks for inviting 44 people into your home <laughs> Thanks for coming and being in my home. It's, it's, this is kind of a new thing. Normally we're outside or we're somewhere. Um, so this is kind of a new thing to get everybody together in my house. I thought it worked out good. It was, it was very nice having you all here. You're okay. great guests. And we appreciate that you uh, making yourself available virtually so we can still continue to offer your programming in the library. So. Well, I, you know, I'll always say yes, Pam. I love you guys. And say hi to Heather and the boys. <laughs> I will for sure. I'll tell them you all said hi. <laughs> all of us say hi. All of you. I'll be like 44 of my new closest friends. I'll say hi. <laughs> all righty. Well, I think we're going to tie it up. We don't have any more questions. Um, and uh, thanks again. Thanks to everybody who participated. Uh, we're really happy to see you and hopefully we'll uh, be sharing some more programs with you really soon. So thanks a lot and thanks. bye. Bye everybody.